pod sass by putting the sass back in sassy sponsored by leader pro where you can book demos with target customers on demand and fill your sales pipeline instantly Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Pod SaaS. I'm your host, Chris Shang, and today we have a very special guest, Dave Meltzer. How are you doing, Dave? I am fantastic. I'm so appreciative of you being here, and I finally get to talk a little bit of tech and entrepreneurship, <laughs> so instead of the whole sports uh, facility talk, <laughs> I'm excited to get back to my roots. Yeah, uh, first things first, You know, I know you're uh, hoping for the Eagles to win, um, and I know they didn't, unfortunately, but you gotta be pretty excited about Jalen Hurts and what he said afterwards. I don't know if you caught that, but he said, you know, you either win or you learn. And I think that perspective around failure is something that you talk a lot about. Any thoughts around that before we kind of like dive into your journey? I did catch that and I was super excited about it because I think the L column is given too big of a meaning in the wrong direction. And so for me, I always say winning is just proof of executing what you already know. Losing, is learning and for me the pain of losing the setbacks failures and mistakes that occur when we lose are the catalyst they're the indicator of where we want to be they actually protect and promote us and especially in the entrepreneurial journey if you don't have a mindset about learning lessons about making mistakes about acceleration aggregating and compounding behaviors in a trajectory of where you think you want to be you're so far beyond where you're going to end up. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs make the mistake of only looking and attaching their emotions to the W <laughs> instead of the L. Absolutely, a thousand percent. And speaking of that, right, like I think, you know, your, your story has been amazing and very inspiring and motivating to a lot of people considering the fact that, you know, you came from modest, a modest background, right? And then had this tremendous success in what I, kind of defer to as like the first chapter of your life. Um, and you're very public about this, but you ended up going bankrupt and then in, in encountering this second chapter of your life. Um, you mind walking us through kind of just like that first chapter, you know, coming from a modest background, being one of six kids um, and, and trying to build up that track record of success and whatever that meant to you, just so people kind of understand what that journey looked like in the very beginning. Yeah, I think my story had three chapters. So that okay. first chapter is what I call the chapter of not enough. And I think a lot of people grow up in that chapter of mm -hmm. not enough, being a victim, always working and looking and saying, why me? You know, why can't I have a dad or a house or, you know, money, uh, all the things that I wanted. And at that time, it started the world of not enough when I was five. Mm. And I thought the way out of the world of not enough was going to be education mm -hmm. only because my mom had two theories of raising six children on her own it was one doctor lawyer or failure and then two fetus wasn't fully developed till after graduate school which i think a lot of people uh, that don't have money fall into that category mm -hmm. um, and so i had to learn about not enough and what i learned through not having enough was that the only way out of not enough was to enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of my potential, to outwork people. And it's a very transactional world. Uh, and yet I had an objective of being rich. I wanted to buy my mama a house in a car, just like many poor kids. That's all they care about. They wanna take care of their family. Mm -hmm. uh, then out of law school, I transitioned into the second chapter. So I ended up going to law school, doing very well, and moving into the world of entrepreneurship uh, following my dream of being rich, following my dream of buying my mom a house and a car, I ended up, instead of being a real lawyer, as my mom called it, I ended up in technology in 1992. Now, the internet, Web 1 in 1992, was very similar to Web 3 today, or even Web 2.5 today, in that a lot of people thought the internet was a fad, that it would never last. In fact, that was what my mom told me when I said I wasn't gonna be a real lawyer. I had studied oil and gas, maritime law, got a high paying job in litigation and told my mom I was gonna sell legal research online <laughs> in 1992. My mom's like, are you crazy? But in that journey, I moved from the world of not enough to starting to, instead of want what other people wanted, to want what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Still motivated by money, still believing money buys me love and happiness, including my mom, a house and a car. And nine months out of law school, taking the entrepreneurial leap and selling legal research, getting involved in the internet, I was a millionaire. And yes, I bought my mom a house and a car. And that to me may have been 
one of the biggest lessons and struggles of being successful so early that I actually confirmed in my own mind that money does buy love and happiness. Mm. I couldn't even imagine the world that I was living in. I, I wasn't taking for granted what other people wanted or even what, what I wanted. I was so appreciative and so beyond my own belief. I have a saying, you can't ever overachieve your own self-image. Well, to me, I almost had, and it, was, it wasn't even real. I would pinch myself every day uh -huh. in fear that it was gonna end because I was living this extraordinary life that money in my mind provided me. It wasn't my skills, mm -hmm. it wasn't my knowledge, it wasn't my desire, it was money that created the happiness. Now, I didn't know that at the time, and three years into my career, we exited for $3.4 billion with Thomson Reuters. Mm -hmm. And then I went on a journey to continually not only make money, but have these dream jobs as a director in the Silicon Valley of a middleware company, CEO of Samsung's phone division, and then ultimately the ultimate job, which most people, I called it a glamorized struggle. Uh, I was CEO of Lee Steinberg Sports Entertainment, the most notable sports agency in the world. So not only was I a multimillionaire, but I had access to what billionaires wanted and dreamed of. Sideline passes, backstage passes, celebrities, athletes, entertainers, billionaires as friends. And I had never been more unhappy in my mm -hmm. life. That was what I called the second chapter, the world of just enough. Uh -huh. And so many entrepreneurs, when they reach a level of success, they live in a world of just enough. They buy things they don't need to impress people they don't like. Uh, and it's a very transactional world. It's a world of quid pro quo. There's many philanthropists in the world of just enough. It doesn't mean you're not giving. It does mean that you appreciate what you have and you acknowledge it. Uh, usually acknowledgement to me means in order to acquire the knowledge of what you have, you can't have it anymore. So what are the ways that entrepreneurs acknowledge? One, they give it away, they waste it, they lose it, uh, they have it stolen from them, manipulated from them, or cheated from them. All have the same quantitative value of acknowledgement. Now, in that world, it's a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. And so that chapter of my life was give to receive, mm -hmm. all the things that you learn, but it wasn't until I lost everything that I moved into the final chapter of my life a world of abundance, a world of value add, not zero sum, a world of more than enough of everything for everyone. And that paradigm shift has led me over the last 17 years into this world of abundance where I can make a lot of money to help a lot of people and have a lot of fun. Absolutely. I feel like, you know, your idea here of like how to actually grow your impact is through empowering others to empower, right? And uh, that's how you get to, get to the exponential uh, outcome that you're looking for in terms of impact. Um, you know, that being said, there is this next generation, right, of Gen Z, of individuals that come from trauma backgrounds or depression and anxiety. How do you kind of talk to them about motivating and inspiring when sometimes the hardest part for them is to get out of bed in the day, you know? Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you say that because a lot of people make a mistake of not meeting people where they're at. So they'll take a generalization of a certain generation or a generalization of a certain socioeconomic background, a certain race, color, size, species, and uh, they go ahead and they use the same, look at the glass half full, <laughs> or whatever, you know, generic type of solution. I think the first step is to understand where people are at. Mm -hmm. And so I actually utilize this as a business tool uh, to understand what people do today. What are you thinking today? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? And I think we don't spend a time meeting, spend enough time meeting people where they're at. And so I think it's especially important with the newer generation, uh, as I'm a parent of four, 23, 21, and 18 year old daughter is a 12 year old son, that I do a much better job today meeting people where they're at. See, if I can meet you where you're at, I can understand your skills, your knowledge, and your desire. Your skills and knowledge determine your basement. And I can align what's doing well today, what's stable today, or what you think is gonna do well with your basement, with your skills and knowledge to give you a greater potential. And then utilizing that in order to inspire you with the mindset, the heart set, and the hand set to effectuate uh, the aggregation that you talked about, the mm -hmm. compounding effect of energy and the acceleration that allow people to determine one thing, progress. 
You see, what happens is when people uh, are focused in on, there's only two, by the way, fears in the world. And they come in many different forms mm -hmm. and many different subcategories. But here's the two basic fears of the world. Fear of the past and fear of the future. Fear of the past results in regret and guilt. And then fear of the future, usually anxiety. And so if I can meet you where you're at in your present, yeah. then I can help you give a different meaning to your past one in which is aligned with the trajectory of what you think you want in the future, but also determine the limitations that you're giving yourself with the fear of the future, the unknown, the uncertain. And so for me, when I'm talking to anyone, let alone Gen Z, I want to know where you're at today. I want to know the subcategories of the manifestation of your fears of guilt and regret of the past. Tell me what meaning you're giving the setbacks, failures, mistakes of your past. And I want to realign or re-engineer the meaning of your past to a trajectory of what you think you want. See, today so many people give a meaning of the past mm -hmm. and it stagnates them, it stifles them, it limits them. And so what I try to do is re-engineer that meaning of the past and then the future gets easier. Once I understand the meaning of your past and the trajectory where you think you want to be, we can lay out what you want today, who you can help, who can help you, how to best get that done and reprioritize your day. You see, prioritization is the antidote to depression. See, if you know what's important to you, you know what to do now. Even more importantly, you know what to do next, regardless of whether it's planned or unplanned. And so if I can get people to understand by giving meaning lessons to mm -hmm. their past and allowing them to prioritize according to what's important to them, not what's important to other people, not what's missing, what they don't have, everything that social media helps to aggregate, compound, and accelerate, but instead allow people to start having a proper mindset, heart set, and hand set to produce a potential of their future. Now it gets easier to reduce, dissipate, and dissolve the limitation of your future, which that anxiety is you. And it all stems from people are trying to look forward and it creates more resistance, void shortages and obstacles until we take care of the meaning of the past by looking for the light, the love and the lessons. See, one of the other subtleties that most people don't understand in finding the meaning of your past is that if you can find the light, the love and the lessons in your past, it will tell you all its secrets. Mm -hmm. See, my life's so simple because every day I'm learning more and more secrets that make my life simple. The subtleties of success exist in those secrets and you can't find the secrets unless you learn the lessons and give the meaning to the past. That's what unravels. That's why some people are like, how the heck did they know that? How, why is it so simple for him? Why, how can they do and be so productive, accessible and gracious with their life when I'm struggling just to get out of bed? Because the secrets lie in the lessons. And when you find the light, the love and the lessons, the secrets will be told to you. Absolutely. A um, couple, two more questions here, but one is uh, around habit forming, right? So I can only imagine, you know, based on how you've you know, portrayed your life before and, and currently presently, how did you go about, and I know meditation is a big part of your life now, uh, but how did you go about forming these positive reinforcing habits that obviously I think lends to a lot of the underlying philosophies that you have today? Well, first I prioritize time and I started to study time. I believe time is a dependent variable of all matter, a subjective and objective matter. And so instead of trying to develop habits, what I started to do was to figure out what creates the habit machine. See, if I could grow my habit machine, if I could strengthen my habit machine, then whatever habit I wanted, I could just put into the machine and then the machine would take care of itself. And so I formulated three different gears or components of my habit machine. And the first component are values. I saw that if I had very strong values about who I was, that I would have the first component or mechanism or gear of a habit machine. Because I would then be able to determine and prioritize different habits to put into the machine and make sure that they were aligned with me. So that was gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, which ended up with three different stages. Accountability is not just responsibility, not just attraction. What did I do to attract this to myself? What am I supposed to learn from it? But also my participation in a perception. And so these three stages of accountability and then finally effective communication 
which led not only to my ability to connect to other people on all five levels of intention, but my ability to connect to something bigger than me, the omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing source that loves me more than my mom. So values was the first gear of the habit machine. The second was my daily practices. Mm -hmm. See, if I could have daily practices aligned with the trajectory, with the meaning of the past and the trajectory of what I think I want, I then could make sure that whether it was nutrition, working out, meditation, financial habits, whatever they were, then I could determine what I want today in the trajectory of what I think I want, who can I help and who can help me in the trajectory of what I think I want, how best to get it done utilizing the lenses of my habit machine of productivity, being of value, accessibility, being accessible to others and accessing what I want and gratitude, finding the light, the love and the lessons in all activities, planned, unplanned, sleep, paid for, unpaid for. And then that fourth component of the habit machine was the re-engineering of priorities, the antidote to anxiety, the antidote to feeling overwhelmed, the antidote to procrastination, all subcategories of anxiety itself of the past and the future. But if I could prioritize what to do now and what to do next, no matter whether it's planned or unplanned, I could be more productive, accessible, and gracious. I could be more efficient, effective, and statistically successful. I could aggregate and compound and accelerate the habits that are in the trajectory of where I think I want to be, which would allow me to make one paradigm shift in the habit machine hmm. from in search of more, more health, more wealth, more worthiness, more happiness to the Moses code. I am. I am happy, healthy, wealthy, and worthy. And my paradigm shift or perspective shift was, what am I doing to interfere with it? See, I live in abundance. I live in a world of more than enough, led by an omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing source that loves me more than my mom. Therefore, if I focus in on not what I think I want that's missing, but instead, what am I doing to interfere what I've already have? being part of everything, an infinite unified system of thought that provides everything, possibility of what, probability of who, perspective of how, reality of now, given the fact that instead of I'm searching for why, applying my why, implying my intellect, my intuition, and my inspiration, my three components of why, Intellect, intuition, and inspiration allowing me to pursue my potential consistently, persistently, taking advantage of the conscious, subconscious, and unconscious realm in which I live. That was the second gear. The habit machine is the definition of my daily practices, which then le led to the third component, which is just executing. Mm -hmm. And executing to me today is repositing, right? Depositing all the information and then distributing it, sharing it, and then prioritizing it, and then executing or redistributing it to people that are better suited uh, with the skills, knowledge, and desire that they have to execute on it. So those were the three components. Really encourage people, I've been doing this for 17 years, so mm -hmm. you're not gonna get this overnight. I'm still practicing. Yeah. And I still get kicked in the face every day. I'm still afraid of my past. I'm still afraid of my future. The only difference is from studying time and utilizing my values, the daily practices in my execution model, I only spend minutes and moments in fear. Everyone else spends, like I did, yeah. days, weeks, months, and years. I just spend minutes and moments with the need to be offended or right or angry or upset. If somebody cuts me off, yes, I say the F word, but instead of being aggravated and speeding up and cutting someone else off and hit, you know, screaming at the person that calls me next on the phone, just I spend moments and I say, stop. What do you want? Who can you help? How can we get there together? Reprioritize, not about the guy who just cut me out on accident, something I've done before on accident as well that has ruined my days, weeks, months, and years. Mm. So spend minutes and moments, utilize time as a dependent variable, have a habit machine, and I'm more than happy to send this stuff to people for free, right? Absolutely. My mission is to empower them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you speak to it. It's, I, think about, I think about pain and, uh, you, it being a muscle almost, right? Like yeah. all these things I feel like you're kind of trying For to mention. Sure a is, it's all a muscle, right? It's like you're building up your tolerance so that you further and further distance yourself from the rest of the crowd ultimately, right? Uh, to be in a position to then give back to teach, right? And so um, my last question here before we round things out is just, 
you know, I know you've been with your wife since childhood sweetheart kind of deal, and you speak a lot about the impact of your mother as well. Um, these two really strong women in your life, how have they molded you or help influence you in part of this journey, this direction? Um, you know, obviously going through a very trying time in the past and, and, and then overcoming that, um, you know, how do you accredit them as, as part of that experience? Because I think we don't live here by ourselves. Yeah, no, my mom uh, was the first to love me unconditionally. Mm. And so as my faith changed to understand that my mom doesn't know what she doesn't know. And my mom was a pleaser. So my mom was extremely positive, ex extremely supportive, would give me everything and still would, including her life. But that unconditional love changed my life mm. and allowed me to have faith that, wow, if my mom could love me unconditionally and she doesn't know what she doesn't know and I'm connected to and through an omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing source that loves me more than my mom, then I'm always protected and promoted. My wife's unconditional love was different though. See, my mom was a, a pleaser and so she was less likely uh, to straighten me out. Mm. Right, she was more, sure. uh, you know, accepting and supportive and enabling. And then my wife uh, is much more significant. Now, I met her in the fourth grade. She hated me when I was little. I did. I was the first boy to ask her to go study at sixth grade camp, and she said no. Um, but eventually, I married her. My wife unconditionally loves me, but uh, it's more an on an honest love. She loves me by trusting me and vetting my decisions, questioning mm. me and telling me what she thinks. And so my wife's love saved my life mm. um, because if she didn't stand up to me, right? You're made by the people that say no to you. They're, you know, be careful the people that say yes to you, especially all the time. Mm -hmm. And my mom was a yes mom. And I'm, I'm sure because she's more afraid for me than she is for herself. And she does unconditionally love me. And I appreciate that. But I more even appreciate my wife's unconditional love uh, that she pointed out to me that I better take stock in who I was and what I wanted to become. She pushes me every day to be my better self. So, you know, I've actually given, given her permission now later on in life because I'm quantumly, I believe in energetic and genetic inheritance yeah so i have a genetic and energetic inheritance to oversell back end sell even lie manipulate and cheat it's just inherent in my genetics and energetic and so my wife not that i needed to but i encourage her now that if she hears me exaggerating or you know overselling things that i i, I rarely lie anymore because i've practice telling the truth and I trust it uh, as hard as it is to tell the truth sometimes especially to your children she's brutally honest and I don't care how much she embarrasses me I will tell you I, I have a quick illustration because I, I laughed the other day I was, I have a studio in Orange County besides the best office in the world yeah uh, I have a studio that we do a TV show some movies out of in Orange County so I went to dinner with some friends and some coaching clients and I oversold it a little bit. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, I, I you know, built this studio in Orange County and, and my wife's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're a partner. You don't own the studio. You're a partner in this, like just called me on my bullshit and embarrassed me, right? And for, I got like coaching clients. I got, you know, I'm, I'm old, but I, like it's still embarrassing. And my initial minutes and moments was like about to be like, I gave her the evil Popeye's evil eye, you know, like, <laughs> are you kidding me? You're gonna embarrass me? Like, this is our livelihood. Like, you could like tell me afterwards. <laughs> and then I remembered, right? That's why I love her. Yeah. That's the difference in my life is that she holds me to a standard that I can reach, that I wanna reach. And she pushes me every day by telling me the truth mm. of what she sees. And she allows me to be myself, um, but most inspirational person in my life, my soulmate, uh, I'm blessed. If I could bless anyone, I get choked up with a relationship like I have. And my children are proof of it. Mm. Uh, I would bless anyone to have the type of relationship I have with my wife.
Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, I do believe we've now interviewed probably a hundred plus like CEOs, founders from s small startups to billion dollar publicly traded companies. And I think the underlying theme there is that the secret ingredient a lot of times is the right partner. Yeah. Um, outside of just your founding partner, but your significant partner. Yeah. And um, my grand, just interject because I have to. It's in my book as well. But yeah. my grandfather gave me some of the wisest pieces of advice. He said three things you need in life to be happy. You need one job that you have learned to love. Love what you do, and a third of your life will be spent in love. Mm. Find the intimate partner. Find that intimate partner. A third of your life is spent with your family and your friends, and that intimate partner will heal all the relationships of your family, her family, all your friends, and then buy the best bed that you can afford. You spend a third of your life yeah. sleeping, and he's from Russia, stooping. You can kind of gather what that means. Yeah. So <laughs> wait, a third of your life working, a third of your life with your family and yeah. friends, and a third of your life sleeping and stooping, and you'll be happy. So those are the best piece of advice. It's in my book as well. So enjoy that. On that note, thank you so much for your time. Three great pieces of advice <laughs> from your grandfather out of that. Um, but yes, uh, super thankful for you carving out the time for us and our listeners and our guests. If there's anything else that I can ever reciprocate, let me know. But thank you Absolutely. for the time. Share my content, do good deeds. And if anyone in your community wants my books or guides, I give them for free. Just sure. email me, david at dmeltzer. Put in your notes, david at dmeltzer.com. I'm happy to sign a book, send it, pay for shipping in the book. I'm truly on a mission to empower others like you are, to empower others to be happy. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris.